Stanford University. Well, thank you, Tim, and, and thanks to uh, NSF, uh, AGU, and everyone uh, for coming and ha giving me the opportunity to, in 10 minutes, uh, talk about uh, hazards prediction. And I'm going to start by talking about hazards sort of in, in general, illustrated with a few examples. I, I can't possibly be comprehensive. And then for the last uh, five minutes or so of the talk, I will, I will talk about something that I have uh, more knowledge of, and that is the, the particulars of uh, hazards uh, related to earthquakes and, and some aspects of the future. So we live on a restless earth and that gives rise to the sort of hazards, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, fires, floods that uh, we'll be uh, seeing uh, today in, in, in the display area. Hazards are, are complex and very interesting phenomena and a lot of us, people like me for example, got into this not so much because we wanted to save the world but because we just found these things really to be really interesting. But from society's point of view, uh, society, uh, these hazards are a threat, and the bottom line is we would like to understand them well enough, that is to have a predictive understanding of these various phenomena such that we can minimize uh, their impact, and that the next uh, speaker will uh, speak to ways in which uh, that can be done effectively. The task is urgent because the, the risks that are posed by hazards are, are growing with time. Cite a particular example, the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Uh, Haiti, like much of the uh, developing world, is growing and, and urbanizing very rapidly. It is uh, a hazard prone area. It has a history of earthquakes. There was an earthquake near Port-au-Prince about 260 or so years ago that was bad, but it wasn't catastrophic in the way the 2010 earthquake was. The 2010 earthquake uh, was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake, so an earthquake of that size happens about once every month somewhere on Earth. So it was not exceptional in terms of its size, but because of where it happened and uh, because the infrastructure there was not uh, robust, the loss of life made it far and away the worst natural disaster in the history of the Western Hemisphere. And this, so this is an illustration of how the exposure to events that we've been through in the past is uh, increasing and making the, the, the study of hazards that much more urgent. Another important reason for studying hazards is that our recent experience, say 200, maybe even thousands of years of experience, does not span the range of possible behaviors. And uh, uh, we heard a bit earlier about Japan. Japan is, is I think, the most tsunami prepared country uh, on Earth. They have a lot of experience with tsunamis. In particular, northern Honshu has experience with very large tsunamis. Still, they did not anticipate the size and extent of the uh, tsunami on March 11th, and they were not uh, prepared for it in, in, in some ways. And that was, so that's sort of a best case scenario for that kind of tsunami. It happened in the middle of the afternoon in, in a tsunami prepared country, and yet it was uh, still devastating. Uh, the, the reason is that Japanese scientists did not anticipate the size, the, really the extent of that tsunami, the southward extent. There's evidence in the geologic record for one to perhaps three similar sized tsunamis in the past few thousand years, but it's, it's uh, long before uh, there's a good written history, so there was uncertainty associated with that. If we go back farther in time into the geologic record, there's evidence for uh, tsunamis generated by sector collapse of volcanic islands that absolutely dwarf any tsunami we've seen in the historic record. And I could say the same thing about other geohazards. These things have happened in the past. They're going to happen in the future, as, as far as we can tell. So we need to understand them, and we need to prepare for them. Yet another reason to study hazards is that the world is increasingly uh, interconnected. Uh, a disaster like the Fukushima uh, reactor uh, uh, reaction to the, uh, the 2011 tsunami has had a horrible effect in terms of the fallout in Japan. It has uh, taken those reactors offline, obviously. They've also shut down their second largest reactor complex in the southwestern part of the country. And the, the impact has reached to Germany. So Germany just uh, about a week ago turned off all their old reactors. That's about half of their nuclear reactors. The reactors in this country are uh, are going to be, are being subject to greater scrutiny. Uh, there's concerns in California. We have a couple of nuclear reactors along the coast. And uh, at our annual meeting this year, we're going to have a session dedicated to better understanding uh, coastal hazards because of this earthquake that happened in Japan. So the, uh, the, the, 
the reach of these uh, disasters is, is global. Now a helpful aspect of, of the, the global nature of earthquake or, or uh, natural hazards in general is that the processes involved are the same basically anywhere on the planet. So if we study and understand them in one place, we can export that understanding uh, everywhere else that's threatened by similar hazards. So the, uh, is this not right? I, Oh yes, that's right. Um, so despite, uh, despite these uh, you know, sort of daunting challenges that we face, these are exciting times in hazards research and you'll see lots of uh, great stuff out in the display area. Uh, and I, I think a common theme, I haven't really had a chance to look through them yet, but a common theme is, has got to be the, the role of technology in, in getting a better understanding of hazards, getting more data, being able to process, synthesize that data into a, a fundamental understanding of what's uh, going on. And I think uh, high performance computing is going to play a key role in this and I, I'd, I'd like to uh, make the argument that it, it allows us not just to codify our understanding of the natural world but to update that and it's, it's really the way, uh, the way of the future, really the way of the present in terms of understanding these really complicated systems that have lots of interacting parts. Now high performance computing is not cheap, it's not easy to do, but it is extremely powerful. So earthquakes are, I think, a, maybe it's my own bias, but I, I think earthquakes are a particularly challenging hazard to deal with. Those of you who were here for the Central Virginia earthquake uh, realize that, uh, appreciate the fact that we didn't give you any warning. <laughs> earthquakes happen without warning. They happen very suddenly. It's only a matter of seconds from when the shaking starts to when it becomes dangerous, at least in a, in a big earthquake. And uh, they're rare, fortunately, but that means we don't have much experience in uh, dealing with them. Uh, and they, and, uh, and uh, the earthquake that happened in Virginia, I, I meant to say, uh, I, someone has argued, and I think this is true, that that was felt by more people than any other earthquake in U.S. history. So the people on the West Coast, let me just say this, get this out there, we don't dismiss that as a little earthquake. It's a, it's a bigger earthquake for you guys. And, uh, <laughs> and it is really, uh, it's, it's really an interesting uh, thing. So uh, the, the slide here shows a, a, a point I'd like to make in that earthquake science is a very multidisciplinary uh, system science. We have lots of uh, inputs uh, into understanding the earthquake problem. That's a consequence of the range of temporal and spatial scales involved in controlling earthquake behavior. And uh, as a result, we have to integrate these into a, a comprehensive understanding of uh, earthquakes. Now, as Tim mentioned, I'm deputy director of the Southern California Earthquake Center. So on behalf of NSF and the USGS that co-sponsors co that center, I help coordinate the uh, scientific enterprise that, that tries to do that. Um, and one of the things we've come to understand through uh, largely NSF-funded uh, research on the Southern San Andreas is that that the entire Southern San Andreas Fault is ready to go in the sense that the time since the last earthquake is longer than the typical repeat times of earthquakes. And so uh, we would not be shocked if the, uh, uh, if the Southern San Andreas Fault ruptured uh, soon in, a, uh, in an earthquake or, or even a series of, of large earthquakes. Now what's shown here is our attempts to uh, model an earthquake on the southern San Andreas, this is California on its side. We're looking towards the northwest. The fault, the, the rupture is going along the fault. The uh, waves, the intensity of the waves are shown in red. This, this is three different supercomputer simulations. What you're about to see is a funneling effect from San Bernardino into the Los Angeles basin that, that occurs because there's a waveguide, a sedimentary waveguide along the base of the the transverse ranges that funnels seismic energy from the San Andreas Fault into metropolitan Los Angeles. Los Angeles is built on a very deep sedimentary basin, so once the waves get in there, they resonate, they reverberate for a long time. Long after the earthquake, rupture has passed, Los Angeles is still shaking. This is an example of the sort of discoveries that can be made through high performance computing. This was not based, uh, this uh, realization was not based on uh, simple simulations or, uh, or data. It was uh, it was based on high performance computing. Now, this shakeout scenario earthquake we use as the basis for an annual shakeout earthquake preparedness uh, exercise. This is, 
not advancing. Yes, here we go. Uh, the shakeout scenario, so that earthquake was a, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake. We're having this on October 10th. This, I think, is the fourth uh, statewide emergency preparedness drill. Last year, we had 7.9 million participants, a large fraction of the state. Uh, we're shooting for 10 million. This year, we have 7.1 uh, million registered at this point, and it's really changed the uh, culture of earthquake preparedness in, in California, but we have a lot of work uh, left to do. It's uh, starting to go viral, so in, in the past year there have been shakeouts not just in California but in Nevada, Utah, um, uh, middle, uh, the middle of the, uh, the continent, the central, uh, central U.S., which is uh, prone to earthquakes as well. In the coming year, there are uh, plans to extend it to Idaho and, and perhaps the uh, southeast as well. And uh, it's also going global. So this is a, a list of different uh, areas in the world that are adopting the shakeout model, working with us to uh, better prepare themselves for earthquakes that lurk in their future. So this is a, a another. Uh, this is our latest uh, high performance uh, computing uh, simulation of a large, even larger earthquake. This is a magnitude eight earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. What you're seeing in the bright colors is the slip velocity on the fault. That's the the action that generates the waves from a dynamic, uh, self consistent rupture model that's propagating uh, to the south. So this one's going the other direction, and in the red are the uh, waves that are radiated from that. This, the uh, simulation of the, the wave propagation was done on Jaguar, uh, the, the supercomputer at uh, Oak Ridge. It uh, used 200, 228,000 cores. It uh, ran at a sustained speed of uh, 230 or so teraflops. So it was really a, a, a remarkably uh, demanding uh, computer job. And uh, it had to be because we represent the state with a 40 meter uh, grid spacing. There's just a huge amount. So I want to highlight just one aspect of this. So this is, this is the start of the simulation. So the earthquake starts up near San Luis Obispo on the San Andreas Fault, ruptures towards the south. This is sort of a typical uh, way that earthquake rupture looks. There's a, a concentration in stress and slip velocity near the tip of the propagating rupture. That's that big peak there. And uh, when we go to the next stage, something uh, quite interesting happens. So you, maybe you couldn't see it, but the, the, the rupture ex suddenly accelerated uh, to the point where it went faster than one of, one of the fundamental seismic wave, wave velocities. It became super shear. So when a rupture uh, becomes uh, super shear, it uh, generates uh, what's a mock cone, which are the diagonal lines radiating uh, behind the, the rupture front. And that's, that's the seismic equivalent of a sonic boom. And it transports, just like a sonic boom, it transports the energy, the shaking, uh, from near the fault to far away from the fault. Now currently, we, we don't have much experience with, with large earthquakes like this. There's evidence that super shear rupture may have occurred in earthquakes like the 1906 earthquake, but it's pretty uh, shaky evidence. But, yeah, all right. <laughs> I can say that because it's my study. But uh, anyway, the... Uh, these sort of simulations are guiding uh, things that, that we're looking for in, in determining whether or not earthquakes really behave this way. And if they do, it's important because this behavior is not currently uh, in, our, uh, in the ground motion predictions that go into the building code. So I'd like to close with just a, a brief mention of the intern program that we have. We have two components to it, thanks to NSF. We have uh, SURE interns, which are sort of focused on domain geoscience uh, work. We also have use IT. Uh, interns, which are uh, they're more IT focused, they're still working on earthquakes, but they're uh, uh, computer science uh, undergrads. And uh, this uh, summer, we had 54 interns at a, at a range of, uh, I guess, 19 institutions. One of them was mine. And through this intern program, we're, we're reaching out to different uh, disciplines, disciplines that we'll depend on for uh, helping us with high performance computing in the future, in order to get them interested in in and, and working on the the earthquake problem. So I'll stop with that and. Uh, take your questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.